Welcome back to Van's reading. We're in chapter 38, the second last chapter. Uh, you know the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Let us begin. Thinking about our life. Chapter 38. Figure 16 is taken from an analysis by Andrew Clark, Ed Diener, and Yanis, George Ellis, of the German Socioeconomic Panel, in which the same respondents were asked every year about their satisfaction with their life. Respondents also reported major changes that had occurred in their circumstances during the preceding year. The graph shows the level of satisfaction reported by people around the time they got married. Oh my gosh. So before, like, okay, so there's the graph. See, like the satisfaction levels and then the time. And then it shows us from minus four to plus five. So basically before the marriage, like they say five years, well, the satisfaction was pretty good. You know, things got up and then as they got married on year zero, it went up intensely. So it starts to decrease. Okay. So it decreases, it decreases. Then it kind of comes back up on the second year. They probably have a child there. Then it comes up and then it decreases, decreases, decreases. Just because obviously you become constant and therefore less, as the saying goes, less is more. But the question is, can you? You need to realize this is now a human being, a partner in your life, and a person who's going to probably be, you're going to learn everything about them, and it's not going to be as fantasy-driven as you thought it would be, because that's what you're constantly thinking. If I'm alone, like, there's a perfect person out there for me, and she'll fix everything, which is not the case. The case is that they're the same person with the same problems, or similar problems, and it's pretty much, you know, it's... That's just the case. But the understanding is you guys are built together. I think the, the key to probably a successful marriage is a great partnership, like great business. But both uh, partners need to have the same goals, climb at the same steps, uh, create a better environment for a family and for themselves so that they equally figure out, you know, how can we be happy in the same environment? So it's really a team effort, I think. It's like a marriage, a marriage is like practically a project, right? Or a relationship, it's practically a project. See, or a business, you want to put it in any way you want it, but you're creating a relationship, you're creating a bond, and obviously the bond comes, but it also, you know, we've designed these, you know, construct constructs where we want to stay together, but our human nature is very erratic and emotional and, you know, we do things when we feel like them. And the question is, how do we avoid... I mean, you have to have discipline. And you need some control over things. But also, you need some breaks from, you know, things. So, it's a very broad, you know, the way I'm speaking now. But the fact is that there is a way to, you know, communicate. Figure out what's your problem. What's your kinks. What's your things. Maybe stay away when this happens. Maybe stay away. Stay when this happens. So, it's kind of interesting. Let's continue. The graph re reliably evokes nervous laughter from audiences and the nervousness is easy to understand. After all, people who decide to get married to uh, married do so either because they expect it will make them happy or because they hope that making a tie permanent will maintain the present state of bliss. In the useful term introduced by Daniel Gilbert and Timothy Wilson, the decision to get married reflects for many people a massive era of effective forecasting. On their wedding day, the bride and the groom know that the rate of divorce is high and that the incidence of martial disappointment is even higher, but they do not believe that these statistics apply to them. The startling news of figure 16 is the steep decline of life satisfaction. The graph is commonly interpreted by uh, interpreted as a tracing, a process of adaptation in which the early joys of marriage quickly disappear as the experiences become routine. However, another approach is possible, which focuses on heuristics of judgment here we ask what happens in people's minds when they are asked to evaluate their life. The questions, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole and how happy are you these days, are not as simple as what's your telephone number. <laughs> how do you survey participants manage to answer such questions in a few seconds as all do? It will help to think of this as another judgment. As also the case for other questions, some people may have a, 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 some people may have a ready-made answer which they have produced on another occasion in which they evaluated their life. Others, probably the majority, do not quickly find a response to the exact question they were asked and automatically make the task easier by substituting the answer to another question. System 1 is at work when we look at figure 16. 
in this light it takes on a different mood okay that's very interesting the case is that maybe some people already have an answer right they prepared it they're, they're going to be saying this all the time and therefore the the data could be incorrect so the question is how would you view an individual you know what i mean you have to view the individual's entire life and he's going to put him down in one sentence and say this is how why i did what da, da, da. when that's not the case it's very much accompanied of emotions and, 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 and situations that happen to you that came to the decision where you've created a stronger buildup of emotions and therefore, you know, decided to get a divorce or you decided to write something. You know, it's a very uh, topic that it can be explained within, you know, depth. And, you know, people, you know, when they write answers to something, sometimes it's very easy and very obviously logic and makes sense. But sometimes asking a very difficult question where it requires a lot of uh, variables and understanding of the whole environment. It's difficult to actually say, you know, what is the exact moment that they divorce? And, and you know, you need a very long experiment of understanding. Okay, but there's also, you know, speculation about, okay, maybe because there's other, you know, you know, people and partners in the area and the environment, and therefore, you know, people take the risk and see if that was worth the risk. And surprisingly, sometimes it can be worth the risk, but sometimes it can be not worth the risk because there's a whole it's a, a speculation of what is good, what is, is great. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. You have an abusive husband, obviously you want to leave the, um, the relationship, find a non-abusive husband or a non-abusive partner, like a wife, abusive wife, you know, or something. That, that's the case. Uh, if... <laughs> It can happen. I mean, that's why I said the husband thing because it's more logical. But there is places where there's abusive women and can force out the relation. Or here's an idea: maybe a cheating wife, and therefore you want to leave, you know, the wife, which is an interesting case. But that's the whole concept of the idea. Sorry, let me repeat that. It's the that's the idea is that you know it really depends on your situation and why you're going to get a divorce. But those are small outcomes. Mostly people just leave because they assume they find something better or they find something different or it's not boring and they get that nice satisfaction feeling and then it punkers down and then that's it. It keeps on going up and down and then people keep on having like three divorces in 10 years, which is ridiculous. So it really depends. The answer to many simple questions can be substituted for global evaluation of life. You remember the study in which students who had just been asked how many dates they had in the previous month reported their happiness happiness these days as if dating was the only significant fact in their life in another well-known experiment in the same vein norbert schwartz and his colleagues invited subjects to the lab to complete a questionnaire on life satisfaction before they began the task that task however he asked them to photocopy a sheet of paper for him half the respondents found a dime on the copying machine planted there by the experiment the experimenter the minor lack Key incident caused a marked improvement in subjects' reported satisfaction with their life as a whole. A mood, a mood heuristic is one way to answer life satisfaction question. The dating survey and the coin on the machine experiment demonstrated as intended that the responses to global well-being questions should be taken with a grain of salt. But of course, your current mood is not the only thing that comes to mind when you're asked to evaluate your life. You're likely to be reminded of a significant event in your recent past or near future of recurrent concerns such as the health of health of a spouse or the bad company that your teenager keeps of important of important achievements and painful failures a few ideas that are relevant to the equation will occur to you many others will not even when it is not influenced by completely irrelevant accidents such as the the coin on the machine the score that you quickly assign to your life is determined by a small sample of highly available ideas not by a careful weighting of the domains of your life People who recently married or are expecting to marry in the near future are likely to retrieve that fact when asked a general question about, about their life. Because marriage is almost always a voluntary, um, 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 marriage is always voluntary, voluntary in the United States. Almost everyone who is reminded of his or her recent or forthcoming marriage will be happy with the idea. Attention is the key to the puzzle. Figure 16 can be read as a graph of the likelihood that people will think of their recent or forthcoming marriage when asked about their life. The silence of this thought is bound to diminish with the passage of time as its novelty wanes. The figure shows an unusually high level 
uh, a high level of satisfaction that lasts two or three years around the event of marriage. However, if this apparent surge reflects the time course of heuristic for answering the question, there is little we can learn from uh, uh, there's little that we can learn from it about either happiness or about the process adaptation to marriage. We cannot infer from it that the tide of raised happiness lasts for several years and gradually recedes. Even people who are happy to be reminded of their marriage when asked a question about their life are not necessarily happier the rest of the time. Unless they think happy thoughts about their marriage during much of the day, it will not directly inf influence their happiness. Even newlyweds who are lucky enough to enjoy a state of happy preoccupation with their love will eventually return to earth and their experience well-being will again depend, as it does for the rest of us, on the environment and activities of the present moment in the daily, I think, resource module studies. Is that what it's called again? The day, DRM? Uh, just let me remind myself. DRM, 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 DRM. Uh, give me a second, guys. I'm just trying to figure out what is DRM. I think it's daily resource modules. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, there it is, DRM. DRM, 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 DRM. Just give me a second. I need to remind myself. Where is it? Ah, day, not... <laughs> It's day reconstruction method. I thought that was the see, I knew that I was right. Uh, da, 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 da. In the DRM, the day reconstruction methods studies, there was no overall difference in experience well being between women who lived with a mate and a woman who did not. The details of how the two groups used their time explained the finding. Women details women who have a mate spend less time alone, but also much less time with friends. They spend more time making love, which is wonderful, but also more time doing housework, preparing food and caring for children, all relatively unpopular activities. And of course, the large amount of time married women spend with their husbands is much more pleasant for someone than for others. Experienced well-being is on average unaffected by marriage, not because marriage makes no difference to happiness, but because it changes some aspects of life for the better and others for the worse. Wow, this is getting deep, man. I didn't expect I was gonna talk about this stuff. I was just like thinking about talking about, you know, in general views, frameworks, etc. But this is like talking about marriage now? God, this is deep. One reason for the low correlations between individual circumstances and their satisfaction with life is that both experience happiness and life satisfaction are largely determined by the genetics of temperament. A disposition for well being is as heritable as height or intelligence as demonstrated by studies of twins separated at birth, people who appear equally fortunate vary greatly in how happy they are. In some instances, as in the case of marriage, the correlations with well-being are low because of balancing effects. The same situation may be good for some people and bad for others. And new circumstances have both benefits and costs. In other cases, such as high income, the effects on life satisfaction are generally positive. But the picture is complicated by the fact that some people care much more about money than others do. That's interesting. A large-scale study of the impact of higher education, which was conducted for another purpose, revealed striking evidence of the lifelong effects of the goals that young people set for themselves. The relevant data were drawn from questionnaires collected in 1995 to 1997 from, approxi uh, from approximately 12,000 people who had started their higher education in elite schools in 1976. When they were 17 or 18, the participants had filled out a questionnaire in which they rated the goal of being very well off financially on a four-point scale ranging from not important to essential. The questionnaire they completed 20 years later included measures of their income in 1995 as well as a global measure of life satisfaction. Goals make a large difference. 19 years after they stated their financial aspirations, many people who wanted a high income had achieved it. Among the 597 physicians and other medical professionals in the sample, for example, each additional point on the money importance scale was associated with an increment of over $14,000 of job income in 1995 dollars. Non-working married women were also likely to have satisfied their financial ambitions. Each point on the scale translated into more $12,000 of added household income for these women, evidently through the earnings of their spouse. The <laughs> So let me just repeat that quickly. Each point on the scale translated into more than $12,000 of added household income for, for these women, evidently through the earnings of their spouse. The importance that people attach to income at age 18 are also anticipated their satisfaction with their income as adults. 
Be compared life satisfaction, high income group, more than $200,000 household income to a low to moderate income group, less than $50,000. The effect of income on life satisfaction was larger for those who had listed being well off financially as essential goal, uh, as, a, as, as an essential goal. 0.57 points on a five point scale. The corresponding difference for those who had indicated that the money was not important was only 0.12. The people who wanted money and got it, were, got it were significantly more satisfied than average. Those who wanted money and didn't get it were significantly more dissatisfied. The same principles apply to other goals. One recipe for dissatisfied adulthood is setting goals that are especially difficult to attain. Measured by life satisfaction 20 years later, the, lo the least promising goal that a young person could have was becoming accomplished in a performing art. Teenage Teenagers' goal influence what happens to them where they end up and how they satisfied they are. Wait, let me just repeat that, sorry. Measured by life satisfaction 20 years later, the least promising goal that a young person could have was becoming accomplished in performing art. Teenager, teenagers' goals influence what happens to them, where they end up and how satisfied they are. In part because of these findings, I've changed my mind about the definition of well-being. Of well -being. The goals that people set for themselves are so important to what they do and how they feel about it, uh, feel about it that an exclusive focus on experienced well-being is not tenable. We can hold a concept of well-being that ignores what people want. On the other hand, it is also true that a concept of well-being that ignores how people feel as they live and focus and focuses on oh god, what is wrong with me? On the other hand, it is also true that on a concept of well-being that ignores how people feel as they live and focuses only on how they feel when they think about their life is also untenable. We must accept the complexities of a hybrid view in which the well-being of both selves is considered. The focusing illusion. We can infer from the speed with people res uh, respond to questions about their life and from the effects of current mood on their responses that they do not engage in a careful examination when they evaluate their life. They must be using heuristics, which are examples of both substitution and what you see is all there is. Uh, basically, heuristics is speculation. Although their view of their life was influenced by a question about dating or by a coin on the copying machine, the participants in these studies did not forget that there is more to life than dating or feeling lucky. The concept of happiness is not suddenly changed by finding a dime, but System 1 readily substitutes a small part of it for the whole of it. Any aspect of life to which attention is directed will loom large in a global evaluation. This is the essence of the focusing illusion, which can be described in a single sentence. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you are thinking about it. Huh. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you are thinking about it. I'm going to just say that a couple of times so I can just like process that nothing in life is as important as you think it is nothing in life is as important nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you're thinking about it nothing in life is as important as you think it nothing in life sorry i'm just going to repeat this because it's just a very complicated nothing in life so any anything sorry nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you're thinking about it. So when we're thinking about it, it is important, but when we're not thinking about it, it is not important. The origin of this idea was a family debate about moving from California to Princeton, in which my wife claimed that people are happier in California than on the East Coast. I argued that the climate is demonstrably not important determinant of well-being. The Scandinavian countries are probably the happiest in the world. I observed, a permanent life, I, observed, uh, I observed that permanent life circumstances have little effect on well-being and tried in vain to convince my wife with her intuitions about happiness of Californians were an era of effective forecasting. A short time later, with this debate still on my mind, I participated in a workshop about the social science of global warming. A colleague made an argument that was based on his view of the well-being of the population of planet Earth in the next century. I argued that it was preposterous to forecast what it would be like to live on a warmer planet when we did not even know what it is like to live in California. Soon after that exchange, my colleague David Schkard and I were granted research funds to study two questions. Are people who live in California happier than others? And what are the popular beliefs about the relative happiness of Californians? We recruited large samples of students at major state universities in California, Ohio and Michigan. From some of them, we obtained a detailed report of their satisfaction with various aspects of their lives. From others, we obtained a prediction for a uh, prediction of how someone with your interests and values who lived 
else we would complete the same questionnaire. As we analyzed the dots, it became obvious that I had won the family, arg the family argument. As expected, the students in the two regions differed greatly in their attitude to their climate. The Californians enjoyed their climate and the Midwesterns des despised theirs. But climate was not an important determinant of well-being. Indeed, there was no difference whatsoever between the life satisfaction of students in California and in the Midwest. We also found that my wife was not alone in her belief that Californians enjoy greater well-being than others. The students in both regions shared the same mistaken view and were able to trace their error to an exaggerated belief in the importance of climate. We described the error as a focusing illusion. The essence of the focusing illusion is what you see is all there is. Giving too much weight to climate, uh, to the climate, uh, too little to all other determinants of well-being. To appreciate how strong this illusion is, it takes a few seconds to consider the question, how much pleasure do you get from your car? Not that much. As an answer came to your mind, I mean, you know how much when you like and enjoy your car. Now examine a different question. When do you get pleasures from your car? The answer to this question may surprise you, but it's straightforward. You get pleasure or displeasure from your car when you think about your car, which is probably not very often. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, you do not spend much time thinking about your car when you're driving it. You think of other things as you drive and your mood is determined by with whatever you think about. Here again, when you try to rate how much you enjoyed your car, you actually answered a much narrower question. How much pleasure do you get from your car when you think about it? Wow, oh, that is so cool. Okay, yeah, uh, that is a pretty cool question. That is interesting. The substitution causes you to ignore the fact that you really think about your car, a form of duration neglect. Neglect, sorry. Oh God, I hate when I do that. I hate it. The substitution caused you to ignore the fact that you really think about your car, a form of duration neglect. The upshot is focusing illusion. If you like your car, you are likely, sorry, let me write that. Focusing illusion, very important illusion. If you like your car, you're likely to exaggerate the pleasure you derive from it. Which will mislead you when you think of the virtues of your current vehicle as well as then as, as well as when you contemplate buying a new one. A similar bias distorts judgments of happiness of Californians when asked about the happiness of Californians. You probably conjure an image of someone attending to a distinctive aspect of the California experience, such as hiking in the summer of admiring the mild winter weather. The focusing illusion arises because Californians actually spend little time attending to these aspects of their life. Moreover, long-term Californians are unlikely uh, to be reminded of the climate when asked for a global evaluation of their life. If you have been there all your life and do not travel much, living in California is like having 10 toes. Nice, but not something one thinks about much. Uh, sorry, but not something one thinks much about. Thoughts of any aspects of life are more likely to be silent, no, more likely to be salient if a contrasting alternative is highly available. If a contrasting alternative is highly available, people who recently moved to California will respond differently. Consider an enterprising soul who moved from Ohio to seek happiness in a better climate for a few years following the move. A question about his satisfaction with life will probably remind him of the move and also evoke thoughts of the contrasting climates in two states. The comparison will surely favor California and the attention to the aspect of life may distort its true weight and experience. However, the focusing illusion can also bring comfort. Whether or not the individual is actually happy after the move, he will report himself happier because thoughts of the climate will make him believe that he is. The focusing illusion can cause people to be wrong about their present state of well-being as well as about the happiness of others and about their own happiness in the future. What proportion of the day do paraplegics spend in a bad mood? That's a weird question. The question almost certainly made you think of a paraplegic who is currently thinking about some aspect of his condition. Your guess about a paraplegic mood is therefore likely to be accurate in the early days of a crippling accident. For some time after the event, accident victims think of little else. But over time, with few exceptions, attention is withdrawn from the new situation as it becomes more familiar. The main exceptions are chronic pain, constant exposure to loud noise and severe depression. Pain and noise are biologically said to be signals that attract attention and depression involves a self-reinforcing cycle of miserable thoughts. Wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty much what depression is. Uh, there is therefore no adaptation of these conditions. Um, paraplegia, however, is not one of the exceptions. Detailed observations show that paraplegics are in a fairly good mood more than half of the time 
as early as one month following the accident. Third, their mood is certainly somber when they think about their situation. Most of the time, however, paraplegics work, read, enjoy jokes and friends and get angry when they read about politics in the newspaper. When they're involved in any of these activities, they are not much different from anyone else. And we expect the experienced well-being of paraplegics to be near normal much of the time. Adaptation to a new situation, whether good or bad, consists in a larger part of thinking less and less about it. In that sense, most long-term circumstances of life, including paraplegia and marriage, are part-time states that one inhabits only when one attends to them. One of the privileges of teaching Princeton is the opportunity to guide bright undergraduates through a research thesis. And one of my favorite experiences in this vein was a project in which, in which I don't know how to say this, but in which Beruria con collected and analyzed the data from a survey firm that asked respondents to estimate the proportion of time that paraplegics spend in a bad mood. She split her respondents into two groups. Some were told that crippling accidents had occurred a month earlier, some a year earlier. In addition, each respondent indicated whether he or she knew a paraplegic person. The two groups agreed closely in their judgment about their recent paraplegics. Those who knew a par paraplegic estimate 75% bad mood. Those who had to imagine a paraplegic said 70%. In contrast, the two groups differed sharply in their estimates of mood of paraplegics a year. After the accident, those who knew a paraplegic offered 41% as their estimate as the estimate of the time in that bad mood. The estimates of those who were not personally acquainted with the paraplegic have averaged 68%. Evidently, those who knew a paraplegic had observed the gradual withdrawal of attention from the condition, but others do not forecast that this adaptation uh, sorry, that this ad adaptation would occur. Judgments about the mood of lottery winners one month and one year after the event showed exactly the same pattern. We can expect the life satisfaction of paraplegics and those afflicted by other chronic and burdensome conditions to be low relative to their experience well being, because the request to evaluate their lives will inevitably remind them of the life of others and of the life they used to lead. Consistent with this idea, recent studies of of Colostomy, I think I don't know how to say this, colostomy, ah, it's colostomy patients have produced dramatic inconsistencies between the patients' experienced well-being and the evaluations of their lives. Experience sampling shows no difference in experience happiness between these patients and a healthy population, yet colostomy patients would be willing to trade away years of their life for a shorter life without the colostomy. Furthermore, patients whose colostomy has been reversed remember their time in this condition as awful and they would give up even more of their remaining life not to have to return to it. Here it appears that remembering self is subject to a massive focusing illusion about the life that the experienced self endures quite comfortably. Daniel Gilbert and Timothy Wilson introduced the word miswanting to describe bad choices that arise from, er from errors of effective forecasting. This word deserves to be in everyday language, miswanting. The focusing illusion, which Gilbert and Wilson call focalism, focalism uh, is a rich source of miswanting. In particular, it makes us prone to exaggerate the effect of significant purchases or change circumstances on our future well-being. Compare, uh, compare two commitments that will change some aspects of your life. Buying a, control, uh, buying a comfortable new car and joining a group that meets weekly, perhaps a poker or a book club. Both experiences will be a novel and exciting at the start. The crucial difference is that you will eventually pay little attention to the car as you drive it, but you'll always tend to the social interaction to which you committed yourself. By what you see is all there is, you're likely to exaggerate the long-term benefits of the car, but what you are not likely to make the same mistake for a social gathering or for inherently attention-demanding activities such as playing tennis or learning to play the cello. The focusing illusion creates a bias in a favor of goods and experiences that are initially exciting. Even if they will eventually lose their appeal, the time is neglected, causing experiences that will retain their attention value in the long term to be appreciated less than they deserve to be. Wow. Okay. Uh, time and time again, the role of time has been a refrain in this part of the book. It is logical to describe the life of experiencing self as a series of moments, each with a value. The value of an episode 
I have called it a hedonic to total. It is simply the sum of the values of its moments. But this is not how the mind represents episodes. Remembering self, as I've described it, also tells stories and makes choices. And neither the stories nor the choices properly represent time. In storytelling mode, an episode is represented by a few critical moments, especially the beginning, the peak and the end. Duration is neglected. We saw the focus on singular moments, both in the cold hand situation and in Violet's story. Violet's story. We saw a different form of duration neglect in prospect theory in which a state is represented by the transition to it. Winning lottery yields a new state of wealth that will endure for some time, but decision utility corresponds to the anticipated intensity of the reaction to the news that one has won. The withdrawal of attention had a adaptations to the new state are neglected as only the thin slice of time is considered the same focus on the transition to the new state and the same neglect of time and ad adaptation are found in forecasts of the reaction to chronic diseases and of course in the focusing illusion the mistake that people make in the focusing illusion involves attention to selected moments and neglect of what happens at other times the mind is good with stories, but it does not appear to be well designed for the processing of time. During the last 10 years, we have learned many new facts about happiness, but we have also learned that the word happiness does not have simple meaning and should not be used as if it does. Sometimes scientific progress leaves us more puzzled than we were before. Speaking on thinking about life, she thought that buying a fancy car would make her happier, but it turned out to be an error of an effective or be an error of an effective forecasting. His car broke down on the way to work this morning and he's in a foul mood. This is not a good day to ask him about his job satisfaction. Mm. She looks quite cheerful most of the time, but when she's asked, she says she's very unhappy. The question must make her think of her recent divorce. Huh. Whoa, okay. Buying a larger house may not make us happy in the long term. We could be suffering from a focusing illusion, miswanting. He has chosen to split his time between two cities, probably a serious case of miswanting. Okay, so that is chapter 38. Where ne next chapter will be the conclusion, but okay, so let's just uh, go through what we've learned here. So we've understand the idea of miswanting something. So yes, that happens often because we don't actually think about the long term and we forget like let's say okay like every kid wants their own apartment right i'm gonna get my own apartment and then i'm gonna be fine that's not the case the case is when you get your new apartment you forget about water electricity uh, things that you have to pay for yourself clothes food that takes everything part of your salary and that's an interesting thing because no one thinks about that when they kids oh i'm gonna live by myself i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that your parents tell you this, but you don't realize and you think that you're smarter than them at the time and you tend to, you know, over miswant. The question is, I'm not saying that, oh, you know, I don't want an apartment, but what I want is though, is that you obviously wanted the independence, but you didn't realize what comes with the independence. But, but and, the other and the other thing is that the independence, what it tends to do is actually make you self-reliant, where in the long term, you do get what you want. You only start to realize responsibility and you start to realize other, you know, meaningful things other than having your, you know, your part, your own place to live in. <clears throat> the, that's just an example. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of miswanting in our lives that we tend to forget. Uh, our views are that we don't think long term because we're living in the short term and in this perspective of we live in the now, in the moment and what we think in this time, as time is passing, every second is going and we think right every second. And so we don't think about the future and therefore we can therefore miss one something in life and that could create different, you know, problems. But that doesn't mean to say you could solve those problems and things can go well. But the case is that you can miss one something and the you know, the mistakes or the, the things that come next can be catastrophic, can be mean, can be terrible, can be unfortunate. But that is life. And so we, you know, we say, oh, I got the new car. But then, you know, the payments come in and then it takes away your salaries or out of your payment. And you're like, oh, I can't do much of the stuff that I used to like to do. So that's miswanting something. So it's an interesting thing about, and then uh, it's an interesting uh, concept. And also 
the idea of happiness. And like he said, happiness is a complicated word and they tend to, you know, mistake it. I think what happiness is, is, uh, what mistake is, uh, happiness is, is, it's a, sorry about the scream, cousins here. Um, but anyway, the, but I think the happiness is, is the tendency to feel really good, really, uh, for some reason I come really satisfied. No. It's more allowing yourself to feel good. And that may gives you this idea of what happiness is. Um, it, you cannot explain happiness. You can, okay, angry, it's more, happiness is more of a description of what it looks like, right? So it's a feeling and the person looks like this, extremely smiling, really good. He's, you know, living life, nothing's wrong. But that's not the case. I think, in, you know, happiness is a... It's a visual idea of what a person you think would be feeling this. And the thing is that you need to describe, define that perfectly. Uh, what does it take to feel like this, making this, you know, it, it, you just get an idea of what happiness is. You get an image and then you're like, ah, and then it brings in an emotion out of you. So, you know, if you have ah, sad, we act like this, we get angry, we act like this. It's an image. And, and that image sparks emotion. Tears, pain, tears, you know, all of these things. But so the question is, obviously, we gain happiness of certain out of certain events because the certain images, feelings, words, it's like a weird, you know, code in our heads that we tend to like, we put our rules in our head that like, oh, if this happens, I'll be happy. But the problem is happiness, sadness, all, you know, you know, tend to disappear, uh, evaporate. And so what you should be thinking about is that the actual satisfaction level stay, right? It stays, which is great. But, you know, that's what life is. You go sad, happy, you know, and this. And, you know, obviously you don't want to be happy when, you know, your parents die or your grandparents die or your friend dies or anything like that. That's not what you, you know, that you can't do that because that is not what we're taught to do. So happiness tends to be taught. I mean, through rules in our own brain. Um you know, I don't, is it, gen I would say we have things implemented like a computer, but if the rules come into play, the computer will act like this. I'm not, and should I compare ourselves to a computer? I mean, we could, but it's a very weird computer. It's a associated computer. It takes things, takes information, brings it out, it acts like this, you know, it's a very interesting thing. My, like, mathematicians tend to say, no, we're not computers, it's a, it's a, yeah, but they don't, you see, the problem is they, the mathematicians tend to have a perspective on things and say, it's a thing or, you know, I think there's a, I can't remember the scientific, science, uh, sign, what's his name? The scientist's name or a mathematician, he's a professor and he explained that the consciousness is uh, somewhere in the part of the brain and that's where it activates and he's making it seem like it's so because he reads all this, you know, from, reads all this in from it information subjectively and therefore has an idea of what, what he thinks it is. The question is you need all the classified information, not classified, all the information in front of you in order to de determine what is um, the actual idea of consciousness and how will it you know, react. I think, you know, he explained that it's a piece of the brain that is activated and there's some type of energy or some kind of, you know, I don't know, electricity of some kind of energy that is there that activates and that allows us to be conscious. But then, you know, it, it, I'm going to deep into this idea of what consciousness is because of the idea of happiness. But the case is this happiness is a state of mind and it dissipates. And that's okay because I think what people want is I want to be happy all the time, which is extremely wrong because that's not what everyone wants. They want to be satisfied and they want to experience positive, you know, emotions generally speaking um but things have emotions are there to, they are put in place to keep you uh, to survive happiness is more of a reward to our own brains and that allows us to do other things and motivates us to act in a certain way that creates more survival etc etc so that's how i view it uh, but yeah that's my uh, thing is there anything else yeah there was one thing of the sentence which really <clears throat> inspired us uh, is that what was that sentence again? I think it was here. It was uh, not this one thing. It was uh, it's basically the way we think. 
Now this one, this is actually a key term. Nothing is in, nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you are thinking about it. So he's trying to say that we only tend to find things important when we think about it, which is an interesting thing. He's saying that like there's certain important things, but we don't think about it, therefore they're not important, but they're out there at the time and we have something on, on, on our brains that we're not that is, we think it's more important at the time because that's what we have available to us, uh, information in front of us. And <clears throat> I think that's an interesting thing because that is the true case. And that may be the case of like, he's talk, talking about why people are generally unhappy. And the thing is because they have certain things on their mind that, you know, are making them unhappy and depressed or sad or whatever. And he explains it in the sentence uh it's a he he pretty much explains depression as it's basically hold on let me find it pain and noise uh are biologically said to be signals that attract attention and depression involves a self-reinforcing cycle of miserable thoughts meaning negative thoughts and etc and it becomes uh, confusing to the individual because he doesn't know what to do and therefore, you know, does certain things and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and acts in a different way. Or, act, you know, you know, some people have like trauma, PSD in a way where like they see something, oh, and then they just turn on and they just, you know, get away from me. I'm gonna need to be alone. And, but that's not the case. The case is the fact, you know, it is kind of like PTSD and it can be, you know, uh, that depression is like being reminded the information hand keeps on coming up because you're forcing yourself to rethink it. So those there here is an answer. If you think about good thoughts, you're going to think about good thoughts. I like if you want to feel great, you just say you, 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 you need to try and not motivate yourself, but have in the correct information in front of you where you can start doing things, sleeping well, you know, eating well, uh, creating, you know, also force yourself to have good thoughts. I think people generally create their own rules and say life is like this and I have to be like this because life is like that, which is not the case at all. It's usually generally people need to, you know, uh, realize that life is an environment and what you need to do is change that environment or make find a better environment where you can actually, you know, move forward and become a better person or a happy person or whatever, you know. Or you want to be a more satisfied person that allows you to feel more positive feelings and happiness, etc. But yeah, that's pretty much chapter 38. Very interesting points here. I really like it. I really like the book. This is, the next chapter will be conclusions. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for now. I want to finish most of my thoughts in the conclusions. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. We're going to keep on. I would also advise that once we finish the conclusion, don't worry, we're going to read more books. Next book is Jordan Peterson. But, but yeah, the conclusion's coming up. And yeah, thanks guys for watching. Uh, very impressive thing. And uh, yeah, leave your comments, likes, subscribe. You know the thing that you need to do. I really need it. Some most people watching, like I'm, um, you know, two minutes. I understand that you know, reading someone reading is not entertaining, but it is an interesting. Uh, you know, just some people just need to, you know, figure things out, which I'm doing. Reading, I'm not the books that I'm reading are more in tune with how I think. And I like logical thinking and it helps me, you know, realize. And I really don't like pseudoscience, you know, like especially like, oh, every day you got to do this. Or, I mean, I don't have anything, you know, thing against them and they, you know, promote very good positive messages. But I like the idea of thinking logically and allowing yourself to understand the core concept. Because some people just get confused with certain concepts and like, oh, but I was doing this and, it, you know, certain things are happening. No, I think we need to clearly define what are certain like really logical positive messages or books not messages more like actual factual <clears throat> things that increase your survival in life etc uh that allow you to understand what to do and that kind of gives you a very important understanding of what you need to do and f not force not force yourself but kind of motivates you into getting up you know, doing the things, taking action, actually doing, you know, increasing that dopamine level. Because I think, you know, psychology and neuroscience come together, but you need to understand that <clears throat> that it's not really completely, you know, together yet. But what I'm starting to understand is that, you know, if you have the correct information, it creates like, you know, 
me messages in the brain that allow us to activate certain information that you've taught yourself. Obviously, this means that, and then it activates, you know, this emotion. Motion activates your movement, and movement activates the goal that you want to attain. So that's my, or actions you want to attain. So that's where I'm coming from, is that trying to find a definition allows us to kind of move forward to our goals. Yeah, so that's it. Anyway, thanks guys for watching. You know what to do. Enjoy. Check you later.